spring is coming and how is my California native garden doing? Tune in to find out. Hi, welcome to Attainable Green. I'm Jess and today we're gonna to be talking about my California native garden. I'm gonna talk about how the plants are doing now, what my future goals are for this space and also some uh, resources and things that I'm looking forward to in the season ahead. So let's get started. To give a little background, I live in Southern California in zone 10B. That basically means we have really dry summers and pretty mild but wet winters. Because of that, um, there are special plants that are adapted to that kind of climate to do well in our environment. I dedicated two areas to grow more native plants because I think it tolerates these conditions a lot better and also increase the biodiversity of my neighborhood. So last year I installed a couple of plants and I'm gonna talk about them and how they are faring now. The first plant is the narrow leaf milkweed or the Asclepus fascicularis. This is the host plant for the monarch caterpillars which eventually turn into butterflies. I had a handful of plants that grew and I also had a couple of caterpillars that were grazing on these plants. So that was great during the growing season. In the winter time, um, the plants die back. And so I uh, cut the main stems down to about a foot to six inches. And um, I just kind of left it there for the winter season. I guess you can say that these plants are dormant since it's basically bare stems for the entire winter season. Now that we're heading towards spring, I'm starting to see a flush of new growth from these stems that tell me that these plants are still alive. Not only that, the springtime also brings pests with them. So there's a non-native aphid that feeds on these narrow leaf milkweeds. You can see these aphids from far away because they are bright yellow in color and they move all over the place. Some people like to leave these aphids as is and let the beneficial insects take care of them. As the weather warms up, I think hoverflies and ladybugs primarily feed on these aphids. So by leaving them alone, um, you just let nature take care of itself. Um, if the infestation is taking over the entire plant and it's causing some harm, then I think it's fine to wash off some of the aphids so that um, the plant itself stays strong and healthy. So even though these aphids are unsightly and usually we don't like to have pests in our garden, um, this one I'm trying to leave as is. The next plant is the Verbena lilacina and I consider this kind of like a lantana alternative. I'm really enjoying uh, the Verbena lilacina. It seems to be pretty tough and in the wintertime it still looks good even though it doesn't have flowers on it. It's just a green kind of hedge. Um, and pruning it is fairly simple. I just uh, trim it into the green parts, not to the woody stem. If I wanted this plant to stay more compact and bushier, I probably could um, prune it back a little harder. But for now, I'm just doing a kind of a light uh, touch up around the plant just to give it a basic uh, shape and form. Um, as for the sweet alyssum in the same pot as the verbena lanacina, it's doing okay. Um, I think it's still holding its own with the verbena lanacina, so eventually they're all kind of blend together and then there'll be kind of a mishmash of purple and white flowers, which should be fine. In the other planter pot, I planted a lot of salvia and penstemon. And in the winter time, a lot of it died back. And that's when you kind of see what plants have survived and what plants didn't survive. So now that things are picking up and warming up, the penstemon is doing okay. It's a little bit dry and crunchy, but hopefully it'll bounce back with a little bit more water. Most of the salvia didn't survive. Um, the hybrid one seems to be doing okay. It still has a couple of leaves, but um, we'll see how that goes as the weather warms up as well. And also I noticed that my ground cover that I added, which is an Argonium, it's a heron's bill. I like how it stays nice and green during the winter season. And then hopefully in the summer season, um, it will start putting out some nice pink flowers. What I didn't account for in this planter pot were the freesias. So uh, three years ago, um, I planted a handful of freesia bulbs in this pot and they never really grew very well. There was always like one or two, but this year is the most prolific year for my freesias. And they just kind of popped up all over. Um, so they kind of ended up uh, falling over and I didn't stake them and a few of them started to flower. So that's kind of nice. And I've just been using them as cut flowers. And I think once the temperatures get a lot hotter here, um, they will start to die out. That will probably be the right time for me to um, flip this space over and add more uh, native salvia to the space and maybe some native penstemon to kind of fill it out. And hopefully um, it'll be interspersed between uh, the freesias and um, 
the native plants. Although I'm trying to add more natives to the space, I'm not going to rip out any plants. Um, I wanna work with what I have and I don't wanna waste any resources in this way. So I'm gonna allow any plants that are still growing in these areas to uh, survive and thrive. Um, if they don't do well, I'm just gonna pull them out and then we can replace it with things that are um, hardier and hopefully do well in this space. Uh, sometimes the natives in this area get a bad rap for looking kind of wild, messy, kind of like weeds. So I'm really trying to push against that and hopefully install some plants that look vibrant and beautiful. Now I have kind of a nice base layer of uh, native plants to work with and this year I'm going to try to build on top of that and see if I can uh, kind of level up this space. Right now I'm looking into plants like uh, Ceanothus. It's supposed to be um, flowering during the winter to spring season. So that kind of covers that gap where nothing really is in bloom, but that one is. Um, another one I'm looking at is a California goldenrod. And I think that one blooms um, from late fall into the early winter time. So that kind of is like a bridge plant between the uh, strong summer plants and then something in the winter season. So not only am I looking specifically for flowers and nectar plants, but maybe some grasses or something to kind of fill in the gaps so that this whole space looks more like a natural landscape or maybe even a cultivated space so that it is aesthetically pleasing and it also increases the biodiversity of this area. And I have a few places in mind that I'd really love to visit so I can get some inspiration, maybe get some plants and kind of see how things grow. The main ones are uh, the Tree of Life Nursery and um, the Theater Payne uh, Foundation. I think they are both, I think they both specialize in California native plants. So hopefully I'll go there and get some ideas. Maybe even get some really cool plants there too. I think the California Botanical Garden and the San Diego Botanical Garden, I think they have great uh, California native landscapes, uh, planting areas. So I can see how some plants grow together and where would be the best uh, ways to use up the space and um, see if I like how things grow together or how things can be planted. So that's where I'm at with this project. I wanted to build a beautiful butterfly garden that's not only uh, aesthetically appealing, but also incorporates native plants so that they're hardier, they're less maintenance, and uh, hopefully they thrive better for the local environment and wildlife. In addition to that, I want to reduce my use of pesticides, insecticides, uh, synthetic fertilizers, and all of that. Um, if I use more plants that are adapted to this region, then I would have less trouble. They should be able to grow like weeds and kind of be like lush and full. And and even though that's not um, the first thing you think about when you think of a garden landscape, um, I think there's still beauty in having the natural California landscape, giving that kind of chaparral, shrubby, uh, a little bit kind of a mix between uh, that desert landscape and uh, a little bit of a Mediterranean one as well. California lies somewhere in between that mix um, in that kind of intersection point. And it'll be interesting to see how this space changes and adapts as I work with it uh, season by season. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel, Attainable Green, to follow along on my journey. I'm gonna be starting a playlist on California native plants, so please check it out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.